Hello everybody, in this video I will start to create a project which could become a series if you guys want it to, which is creating a game in Rust, Askimon, or in other words, Pokemon in ASCII. So you're probably wondering why we're using Rust instead of C++, and the simple reason is that Rust has been a language which has just sort of interested me for quite a while now, and so I just wanted to give it a try. So anyways, Pokemon is a very large game featuring a huge world to explore, items, battles, storylines, and of course, many different creatures to capture. And so because of this, there was a lot of different places I could have began working on my version of it. What I decided to work on first was the world to explore, but before I could actually do this, I first had to set up some kind of basic engine at least for which I could actually create my game in. This can actually be seen being created in the video right now, starting off with something pretty important, the rendering system. Although the game isn't going to be using any actual real graphics, things such as the world and the creatures still have to be drawn, and I can create certain abstractions to assist in doing this. In my case, I'll be using ANSI terminals to draw the game, which means I'm able to use ANSI escape codes to have a fair amount of control. For example, I'm able to set the background and foreground colours using RGB, and I can also set the position of the cursor inside of the terminal, all of which is very useful for creating a game. After implementing the basic abstractions for rendering text and colour to a terminal window, I wanted to actually work on the core game engine itself, such as a game state system. This would control what part of the game is active at the current time. A couple of examples for game states would be the player roaming the world, or an Eskimon battle. To start off, I created a trait called game state, of which requires other game state structs to implement functions for handling input, updating the game, and then draw whatever needs to be drawn at that point in the game. For example, let's hit the game state where the player is roaming around the world. For input, this would be asking the user where they want the player to walk. Updating would be actually moving the player and also testing for collisions with objects which block the player from walking in the world. And then finally, drawing would be drawing whatever part of the map the player is currently located in. After the basics of the core engine were completed, I wanted to create a simple user interface for the user to actually interact with the game. To do this, I expanded on the rendering system created earlier by adding support for splitting the render area into sections. Each one of these sections would have their own borders surrounding them, and would also have their own render origin at their own top left, which would make drawing to them a lot easier. This can be seen here, where I split the game into three render sections. The logo at the top left, the user input could be entered at the top right, and then the game itself could be drawn to the larger section at the bottom. After setting up the display in the user interface, I wanted to actually begin working on the actual game itself, which to start off would be what I said earlier, allowing the user to explore the world, which is exactly what I'll be doing for the rest of the episode. Without libraries, getting real-time input to work in Rust would be a bit of a pain, and so instead the input for the game would be entering commands as a string, and then having the input function of the game state's interpreter. For getting player input for moving around the world, this would be a direction, either x or y, followed by a number for how far they want to travel that way. For example, moving the player to the right by 10 tiles would be the command x10, where x is the direction they want to move in, and 10 is the amount they want to move in that direction. This can be seen here. I'm entering the command in the top right input section of the user interface, and then the at symbol, which represents the player, is moving in that direction by the amount I specify. Sending these move commands also tells the game to redraw, which means it will clear the game render section before drawing anything. This uses the return result of the input function of the game state, which is just an enum, which is then pattern matched by the game struct telling it to redraw. Now that I had player movement working, I wanted to actually have a map for the player to walk in, but this had its own challenges. In the actual game, the player doesn't actually move, but rather the world is moved around the player who stays in the centre of the screen at all times. Normally this wouldn't be too much of an issue to implement, but because this is the game being played in the terminal window, features like this actually become a lot harder to create. So here we have the player at the centre of the window, and we want to draw the world map around him. Loading the entire map at once however would be a waste of memory, so I'm going to split the map into chunks of around 100 by 50 in size. So let's take some map chunks where the player is located, and then position them around him. Quite immediately, the issue can be seen. A lot of the map chunks would in fact be outside of the rendering area if they were just simply placed there. Using normal graphics, this is usually not actually an issue, as those pixels outside the rendering area would simply get discarded. But this has been drawn to a terminal window, and the characters are still going to be right there. So, how can I go about solving this issue? To do this, I first load the maps around the player. This is done by converting the player's position in the world 
to the map position. The conversion is done simply by taking the player's position in the world and then dividing it by the map size, and this gives you the map position. The map file names correspond to the location in the world, which makes it very simple to load the correct map. For example, the map at location 00 has the file name 00. The maps are loaded into a vector of string objects, uh, where each element string is a line of the map. When it comes to actually drawing the map, I first find the lowest position of that line that can be drawn, and then also the largest position. And then, drawing the map is as simple as leaping through the vector of lines and then creating a string slice using the minimum and maximum positions I found earlier, and then just drawing them to the correct position of the terminal. This can be seen working here. When the user is telling the player to move around the world, the map instead is moving around the stationary player who stays in the centre. You can also see the map section edges, where one map chunk ends and the next one begins. Now that drawing maps work, it was time to make things a lot more interesting and add some actual colour to the world. To do this, when I find the string slice with a map line before drawing it, I cycle through the line looking at each character it contains. Each character has its own colour associated with it. For example, full stops represent grass, and so are green. So while cycling over the characters, I can add ANSI escape sequences for the character, so that when it is printed to the terminal, it has colour. The coloured world can be seen working here, and it's already starting to look a lot better than it did before. So now that colour works, I just wanted to create a more better map, just to see how it looks. Creating maps for the game is as easy as creating a file in the text editor, and then just making a little area 100 characters wide and 50 characters tall. For this map in particular, you've probably noticed the commas and the pipe symbols being used on the right hand side. These characters represent taller grass, and it's where Wild Askimon will eventually be able to be found. This is how it looks when it's loaded into the game. Different symbols have different colours, and in general, I think it's starting to look alright. I then added a couple more areas surrounding the place just to see how it looks and to test things out. And on that note, I guess that's the basics of exploring the world completed and the end of this episode. If you would like me to continue this series, please let me know in the comments below. Lastly, shout out to my super patrons. Thank you, Kelly Crazyman, Timothy Gibbons, Timo Schrader, and Alan Fernandez. Thank you for the support. Anyways, once again, thank you for watching. Source code is as per usual available in the description below, and well, see you next time.